Ron? Okay. Hello, everyone. So when I left Los Angeles, it was 74 degrees. And I got to say that I am dying to get back because it is freezing out here. So anybody looking to move to better weather, we're hiring. So let me know after the conference. Um, I'm talking about improving the user's experience. This is who I am. My name is Scott Rayo. I'm CTO and co-founder of Combatant Gentlemen. And a little background about our company. Combatant Gentlemen is a direct-to-consumer, vertically integrated startup in menswear. In fact, we're so vertically integrated that we actually raise our own sheep for the wool to make our suits. We control every aspect of the supply chain, giving us huge savings, oops, giving us huge savings in the production of our clothing, savings that we then pass on to our consumers. So it's incredibly difficult to sell a $160 suit and get people to believe that it's made from high quality. So one of the factors that we employ in, in, our, in our thinking is to make sure that every user that hits the site or experiences our brand at any time gets the best possible user experience they can. So let's define it. What is user's experience? First, it's everything. User experience is everything from how a customer views your website to how they interact with your products offline. Second, it's the future. As technology gets cheaper and cheaper, to build and use, the defining factor that will define apps, software, and gadgets will be the user's experience. At uh, a uh, show of hands, how many people use the Spree API? Oh, good amount. So I'm assuming that the people that do are using some sort of client-side application like Backbone or Angular or Ember. Cool. So what is user experience? Well, user experience is so complicated that we're going to try to simplify it and define it in three ways. First. It's a set of business objectives and goals. It's the technology that, 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 that the business objectives require and use. Third, it's the design that communicates to the user. Oops. It's really complicated. There's a, lot of go there's a lot to go on. There's a lot to think about. So at Combatant Gentlemen, we actually define a user's experience. When a user connects with our product or service, while completely forgetting that he or she is interfacing with technology. So every time that something happens that to, to, the, to the browser, when you click on a link and something doesn't happen and doesn't give you the expected result, now the user has to sit back and think, oh, that's right, I'm dealing with the website, I'm dealing with some technology, and they have to put their system man hat on and get in there and try to debug the situation going on, completely, completely killing that user's experience. So who is the user anyway? The user is anyone who interacts with the product, technology, or service that you've built. The user can be consumers who buy goods from your store, or it can even be customer service reps within your company. The user can even be yourself. You probably view your store as a traditional Rails app naturally. You have models, views, controllers that interact with the web server, the browser, back to the controllers, and so forth. I'd like to introduce a different way of thinking about Spree. Imagine your Spree installation not as a traditional server client web app, but rather as a service, or Spree as a service, SaaS. With, with, with this way of thinking of, of your storefront, mobile app, and third-party integrations, all consume data from Spree the same way with the API. This allows for a more consistent experience, not only for your consumers, but for your developers as well. So Spree 1, 3, and up, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. By using the API, you can build and deliver a next generation user experience fairly easy. So I'd like to share some real world examples and tips that we've encountered at Combatant Gentlemen, all embracing this philosophy that Spree is a service. So there are much smarter people than me uh, that have done extensive work. <laughs> Brian. <laughs> um, so you can check out Brian's Backbone JS talk and Ryan's implementation of Backbone and Marionette. It's a very good starting point. It's how actually we started. Um, when, sh when I Sean first approached me, it was like a year ago, we were on the fence whether we should build our, our, our cart and spree. And he said, and I had some re re reservations about it because I, I just wanted to get in and kind of have full control over what was going on. He says, no, no, no use the API. It's, it, it'll, it'll be great. And when, once we did that, we were able to build a site and store in 10 days. And it was really easy to do. And these two, these resources amongst others on the web helped me get started very quickly. So let's talk about design and designers. In the first example, I want to talk about how to free your designers to produce ever-changing, elegant user interfaces. Good design is usually at the heart of a good user's experience. 
and decoupling business logic from the interface is the first step. So I want you to meet Brandon. <laughs> Brandon is our lead UI UX engineer. He's an extraordinary front end designer, graphic artist, and all around good guy. Brandon, however, gets a little grumpy when you mention databases or Ruby. He has little patience for the nuts and bolts of web applications and would prefer to design in pure HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So enter Backbone or whatever other JS framework you'd like to use. To accommodate the needs of our designers while keeping the idea that Spree is a service, Backbone is a perfect solution for Brandon, along with the rest of our team. He focuses on developing the best user experience without Rails getting in the way. Consider this code example. So here we have a, a standard Spree index page for products. Now, to most of us, this looks fairly straightforward and somewhat, somewhat simplified, which is great. But what we don't see, that what, what Brandon sees, is that th there's all this logic that's, that goes into rendering partials, right? So you have all of this. And so Brandon now has to like, think about his view when he's designing in terms of how Rails structures its code. Take this example. This, we, we actually use handlebars. And um, in this example, it's very simple for Brandon just to be able to get in here, visualize what's going on with the interface, and he can move on. And there's no really wrong choice with, uh, with client-side templating. For an example, there, there's tons you can out there, and this is, like I said, there's not, not, no real wrong choice to it. So we decided to go 100% 100% JavaScript-driven web application. So I'm going to share with you some of the things that I've learned along the way. Um, and kind of like our journey through getting to 100% client side and, ha and absolutely doing zero server side rendering <coughs> for our views. The first thing that, that, uh, that I encountered was handling flash messages. Because the page isn't reloading, the flash message isn't getting passed down to the view properly. So, uh, you, so I wrote this simple method, which basically sends the flash message in the headers. And then once it's done, we just dis discard it. And then we use this this function here, which basically all the stuff on the top is just how it gets rendered out to the view. But the real secret to this is when the, when the AJAX request is completed, then it fires that flash response to, back to the user, allowing you to control uh, what the user sees for errors and notifications and stuff very, very simply. This is probably, if anything you take away from this talk, this is probably going to be the one that I want to be, that I want you to walk away with, is be eventually consistent. So if you take this code example, you can see, in fact, it's scoped wrong, but it's okay. If you see that um, wh when we're changing the name of something, here it's put in the success callback of this, of this event. Now, that might seem like a natural approach, because obviously when you make a request and su success comes back, um, we want to do something with that. Um, but you don't have to, right? M move the move the thing that you want changed to the interface outside of the success callback. And then in the error message, or the error uh, callback, what you want to do is you want to be able to do some sort of undo or, or notify the user that that didn't happen. So that way the user sees things that happen on the site immediately without having to wait for the server to respond. And you, you only kind of want to do this um, when you almost always know that the request on the server will never fail. So this is very simple, like when you're adding to cart, show the user, show the, the contents of the cart immediately, show the product in the cart immediately, don't wait for the server to respond. And if something happens, then go back and undo it and then notify the user that, hey, look, something didn't happen correctly. Be eventually consistent. That's so another thing that we encountered um, was SEO, because Doing it 100% client side ran into issues, and sure, Google has uh, techniques that can render your pages efficiently and so forth. Um, but what we found was that you know that's great for Google, but we want to be everywhere. We just don't. I mean, Google's big and everything, but we want to be in all search engines, and we want anything to be able to like parse our page and so forth. So, so enter prerender.io. It's a pretty cool library. Basically, what it does is that every time that it knows that a, a crawler is hitting the page, what it'll do is it will send that request out to a phantom JS node, and it will parse the page for us and spit out the HTML for us uh, on, when, every time that it, that happens. So this saved, this saved us from having to write uh, two separate views or having to compile the views ourselves, and uh, it works, works really well. So the next thing 
it was testing, right? Because um, working with the client, there, there's, there's still, there's still room for error, and what we decided to use is a testing suite called Jasmine. It's really cool because first it's BDD, right? It's very similar to RSpec or, or anything like that, which is, which is pretty, which is pretty neat. Um, JSON fixtures, so it's just using pure JSON as, as your data source. So when you get in there, you can easily work with the, the same exact data that you would be getting over the wire. You get jQuery and, and everything else. So you can do things like get JSON, which you can then test to make sure that the API is functioning properly and is returning the right stuff. You get underscore, so you have a whole array of, of things that you would have in, in the DOM. So performance is interesting. Because we all know that slow performance can bring your user's experience to an excruciating halt. I want to show you some tips that, that we use to get the po best possible performance from Backbone and the Spree API. The first one is obvious. Load everything from a CDN, right? Don't, don't, let, the, don't let your web server handle like, the assets. And, and using S3 is great, but try, try cloud, CloudFront. Second, full page loads are expensive. Not only do they have to download the data over the wire, but the DOM has to then has to process what's going on and then draw the appropriate elements. So try to avoid full page loads. And we, we accomplish that because we're, it's 100% client side. And so every time we make a call, we're just pulling JSON down. Um, and sometimes we actually just cache the JSON straight on the server. Um, very, very, very cool. Um, so at Combat and Gentlemen, we we actually do a lot of things offline as much as we do online because we're selling suits and shirts and ties. People need to try them on, right? So we actually had an event um, in downtown Los Angeles. We did a pop-up event. Um, in this example, um, like I said, we hosted in LA and found some pain points when translating the online experience to offline. We also wanted to sign up customers into Spree, extending the long-term value of the sale. Not only did we want to be able to use Spree to transact the sale, but we wanted to be able to get more from them and keep that conversation moving. So we looked into Square. Um, the thing about Square is that it wasn't real time. It didn't, we can, sure, we can integrate it and, and pull the data out and batch it out and import it in or, or whatever, but it wasn't in real time, so it, it didn't allow us to get the kind of efficiency we wanted, so Square was out. So like I said, the problem is that we wanted to have all offline purchases run through Spree. Having customers place a purchase through a laptop wasn't an option. As the customer would lose focus of how amazing they felt when they were trying on clothes. It had to be simpler. We didn't want, we didn't want to have the person come over, try on a suit, and say, excuse me, please enter your contact information or, you know, y y fill out this uh, checkout process because they're kind of on the go, they're in a different mindset, right? So the solution we came up with was using this linear barcode reader scanner. So we just UPC'd all of our clothing, we would scan it just like how you would at the Apple store, swipe the card, and by communicating with the API, we're able to transact that process very seamlessly. The next thing we wanted to do is we wanted to, we wanted to think outside of the box um, when working with Spree and the API, or just technology in general. So we created the super sweet magic mirror, and this is actually me and Tony Shea demoing it at the Vegas Hackathon. Um, what's cool about this mirror is that it's a two-way mirror with a TV in the back with RFID reader at the bottom. The RFID reader with RFID-enabled clothing allowed, us to, allowed, us, allowed the cu customer to walk up to the mirror with a suit, the suit would then P the RFID would pick up on the mirror, the TV would then display like related items about for that suit, it would display the price, it would display details. It's actually pretty interesting. And that would communicate right to Spree and back to the user. Um, I wanna talk about internal use cases because I said that the user, yes, it's your customers, but it's also your customer service representatives. When you're building for the user, you wanna build for the people that are using the technology that you're, that you're writing for. So um, at a show of hands, does anybody use the hub or the integrator? Oh, cool. Awesome. 
So we found that the Spree Hub was a lifesaver for us. Um, there are a lot of uh, integrations that the Hub does really well. Um, but what we wanted was we wanted to get that data out so we can do our own analytics, our own reporting. We wanted to give our customer service reps better insight into, into who they were dealing with, who they were working with, and so forth. So we decided to use custom endpoints. And what that gives us is custom dashboards. So we built this uh, internal app, um, we call it Tower. And basically, um, we pull all this data in and we're able to aggregate in a way that makes sense for our customer service reps, our salespeople, our, our finance guys, to be able to understand what's going on within the company and without them having to log into Spree because the last thing we want as engineers is having our business guys come in and just mess everything up on for the user. So we decided to build this dashboard. Um, since we're vertically integrated, we do all of our own fulfillment. Um, so we take it all the way down from the sheep all the way to point of sale to the shipment and fulfillment and everything. So pick pack ship was important. So we, did, we used the same type of technology that we use with the barcode scanners for the point of sale, and we built our version of our pick pack ship, which is the shipping people can go around with this device, scan UPC, say that this is what the products I need, put it in the box, it would automatically print out the labels, they put on the label and they scan the, uh, the tracking code and they were done. So this, this saved us so, so much time by doing it this way. And that's it. Thank you. No, it's not, no. We, we have plans to possibly do that, yeah. Um, but um, we, we're just using it internally at the moment, and uh, it's, it's been a lifesaver for us, because now we have full control over data that we, that, I mean, we could do in Spree, but now we can do things that go beyond that, like, like business intelligence and analytics and something like that. But it's not open source, but that's a good idea. There we go. I had a question on the uh, the warehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, was that a native app or a mobile app that they're holding on the phone? Native. Yeah. And yeah. was that directly talking back to a Spree instance, or is that a separate app? That, that was talking back to our ERP tower, right? Which with the hub would then collect all the data in, and because we put all that data into tower and organize it in a certain way, um, the app then connects the tower and allows us to kind of do all the fulfillment within Tower because we're going to collect other metrics too, like response times, like how quickly can our fulfillment or shipping guys fulfill an order, and we want to manage that, right, and kind of almost let them compete to see who's faster or and with with quality, right, um, with consistency. So, uh, with the Linnea barcode, did you yeah. guys also use that for Tower? Yes, yes, it's a pretty cool device. Uh, it's fairly simple. Comes with um, uh, Objective C uh, header files. You just drop in and and uh, and it, the API is, is fairly straightforward, and you just picks up on a barcode, and you can then do something with that. One one last question: yeah. Is the Tower ERP something you guys custom built? Yes. Very cool. Hi, I'm over here on your. Hey. Oh. <laughs> so, um, did you when you implemented uh, prerender.io? Yeah. Um, can, did you see a definite difference in your in your search referrals? Uh, so before that, did you have um, did you launch with pre-render or did you? No, we, we didn't launch with pre-render. And when we when we built the app and moved forward, we were trying all kinds of wacky techniques. We actually would like try to render the pages ourselves on deployment, and you would have this you know static HTML sitting on the server so that Google can then crawl it. Um, and you know there's it's you're just adding like so much more complexity that it didn't make any sense, and sometimes our pages wouldn't get crawled at all. And uh, so with pre-render, like, everything is crawled now. Um, all of it appears in Google. Our SKU set is so small that it's not, uh, like, a big priority for us for SEO, because, you know, when you're dealing with a handful of SKUs versus thousands or millions, um, we, don't, we don't experience that much traffic from search engines. 
only if they're looking for the product they're looking for. Similar to what, when we heard Andy talk about Bonobos, is that nobody knows who you are, so you have to get that word out and start storytelling, and then they start searching for combatant gentleman suits, and that's how they find us. But, yeah. but uh, pre-render is a great library. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. So why did you choose to build an ERP rather than using an existing? Uh, my background is in enterprise software. Um, before I was doing this at Combatant Gentleman, I was doing very similar things like we were doing with this ERP. And also, w we have a, such a strong relationship with our factories in China that once we went over there and set them up on it, we found that we can do a lot better um, in terms of just making it like web friendly um, and having and having like full control over that data, we can then do things that are specific to us and not worry about like having to figure out how you know um, Oracle or SAP how they might do it. And then there's also an added cost with that, right? So I choose like open source route, and I wanted to build something that was more designed for our specific use case and not have to worry like an off the off the shelf solution. <coughs> 